Good morning and welcome. I'd like to welcome you to, um, it's officially called strategy session number two, um, implementing bold teacher effectiveness reform. Um, Secretary Scandera will be your moderator um, to our panelists. Um, and before she begins, I'd like to do just a couple quick um, housekeeping. Um, there will be a Q&A um, at the end of the session, about 25 minutes, so everybody will have an opportunity to ask questions to our panelists. Um, please know that the session is being recorded, so we will need you to go to the microphone um, to ask your questions. And with that, Secretary Scandera. Good morning again. Um, it is truly my privilege to get to moderate this, this panel. Um, I think this is one of the most exciting topics across our nation right now. What are we doing to really honor and champion our great educators? And when they're um, not those great educators, what are we doing to provide alternatives? And so I'm sure we're going to have lots of robust conversation. I will tell you, I mean, all of you know this, or you probably wouldn't be uh, sitting in this room. We know our teachers are change agents. Uh, they make the most uh, difference in our schools if they are um, equipped and excellent. And um, we have seen multiple studies telling us that a great teacher in every classroom would close the achievement gap across our nation. So I think um, each one of us has that charge and challenge. How do we get the best and the brightest in each one of our classrooms to create the real change that's possible in our schools and our states across the nation? So um, for a little context, um, over 30 states right now received waivers. Any state that received a waiver from No Child Left Behind also had the opportunity to propose an alternative um, evaluation uh, for teachers and school leaders based on improved student achievement and prioritizing improved student ach achievement in their evaluation. So we've got numerous states across the nation right now um, on a mission to, to really bring forward the possibility of our great educators and attract and, and recruit those who aren't in education yet that should be. Uh, so that has uh, certainly been a, a big momentum shift, I think, in regards to teacher evaluations and what's possible. Prior to that, we had race to the top states. They also were given the opportunity and the charge and the challenge to look at teacher evaluations in their state and say, how do we prioritize improved student achievement? So, um, today we'll get to hear from Kevin and Jill in just a minute. I'll share a little bit about them, and then we'll we'll turn it over. Um, I think, and this is I, I don't think this data is um, unique. I I have the privilege of representing the state of New Mexico here, and I will tell you that today in our state, 98% of our teachers who are teaching receive the highest level um, that of. Uh, that they can in evaluation. We have a two-pronged system. You either meet competency or don't. I always say that's kind of a shame. I don't know another profession that the best you can do is meet competency. But in our state, that is the best you can do right now. But that's uh, We're on a fast track to change that. And when it comes to that meet competency or not meet competency, 98% of our teachers today meet competency. Um, I am um, absolutely proud of what is taking place in New Mexico in regards to change. Uh, Governor Bush talked a lot about accountability. We also are grading our schools. Uh, lots of changes around third grade reading, etc. But I will tell you today that um, while 98% of our teachers are uh, meeting competency, the highest um, uh, evaluation they can, can receive, we are um, consistently rated 48th or 49th in the nation when it comes to student achievement. Our student achievement is not commensurate today with um, the, how we are evaluating our teachers and what we're saying in regards to their effectiveness. And I have often said, many, many folks as they embark on this challenge, uh, it's, they're accused of being anti-teacher, negative, et cetera, and um, it's actually quite the opposite. We have no way of championing those great teachers in our classrooms and acknowledging those who are missing that mark and providing an opportunity either for change or like any other profession saying, maybe this isn't the best match and that's okay. But when it comes to our kids, we want the best and brightest. And so as we embark on this, I, uh, I will say that the privilege once again to introduce Kevin Huffman, who is the commissioner in Tennessee. He's been there since April 2011, so he's on a fast track. I was chatting with him this morning. He has 
100 and how many districts? 136, 136 districts in his first year, he visited every single one. Um, so, I mean, right there, um, unbelievable, I will just say, from one commissioner to another, that is, um, that is a commitment. Um, and he has been a, about change since day one. I would say Tennessee is a, a leader across the nation when it comes to implementing uh, teacher evaluations, and, and Kevin will tell you a little bit more about that. His background, he started in Teach for America in Houston as a first and second grade teacher and has, over time, uh, wherever he has been, been a change agent, so much so that the great state of Tennessee said, please come join us and, and bring home uh, more change for our kids. So we're excited to hear from Kevin. We also have Jill Hawley here with us, another state who is really leading when it comes to teacher evaluations and implementing this, uh, a new system. They're in their third year of implementation. We'll get to hear from Jill. She is the, uh, at the Department of Education, they're the Associate Commissioner for Achievement and Strategy, has an unbelievable commitment and background um, when it comes to serving students and making a difference um, in our education system today. So we get to hear from two um, stellar folks who are living it, breathing it, and I'll start off by, and we'll have Kevin speak for maybe five minutes or so, then Jill. We'll do a little bit of back and forth question, then an open up for you to ask questions as well. First and foremost, um, I just, I wanna ask Kevin, number one, if you had it to do all over again, is there anything you'd do differently? Number two, what would you absolutely do the same? Um, and as, you're, as you look back, what are some aha moments you've had as, uh, in, in regards to really beginning to move the needle when it comes to, to uh, your teacher evaluation system? So we'll start there. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning. See, this was Tennessee. It would have been good morning. <laughs> um, let, me, uh, let me start just by explaining what the system is really quickly. So I'll, I'll do this very quickly. So we, last year, fully implemented across the state teacher evaluation system, every single teacher, and this was created in statute in advance of our application to raise to the top. So it predated me, the, the construct of it. 50% of the evaluation is to be qualitative, which in our case is mostly observations, two to four observations against a very structured, very clear rubric over the course of the year, half at least have to be unobserved, I mean unscheduled observations. 35% growth measure, so that is for teachers who have, who teach in tested subjects, value added scores for them individually. And for teachers who don't in Tennessee, we used school wide value added scores. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. And then 15% other achievement measure, and this is one of those nebulous things that got negotiated into the legislation and the idea was that teachers and their principals would come together and agree on some quantitative measure that they were gonna use, graduation rate or uh, Perkins tests in the case of CTE teachers or other exams that people felt were um, accurate. And I'll come back to that in a second. When I started in April of 2011, in my first week on the job was the last meeting of the committee, the advisory committee that had spent the previous year meeting 20 some times to develop the evaluation system. And it included teachers, um, principals, district leaders, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, I came in, I think, in a very helpful way, completely naive. I came in and um, my understanding was that Tennessee had promised in the Race the Top application that it was going to implement teacher evaluations in the 2011-12 school year. And that this committee had met 20 some times designing the system. And it literally never crossed my mind that we wouldn't do it. I just assumed, I'm in this job, we said we were going to do it, ergo, we are going to do it. It turned out that not everybody shared that assumption. And as time moved on and it became clearer and clearer that this was actually going to happen across the state, the noise started to get incredibly loud. And at this moment in time, a year ago, um, it was unbelievably loud across the state. And all you could hear was how terrible this evaluation system was. 
This evaluation system made no sense. This was terrible for principals. It took too much time. It was terrible for teachers. They had to figure out how to use this convoluted rubric. It was awful for kids. It was um, doing all sorts of terrible things. Everybody had an anecdote and legislators in the room. Every legislator um, got hundreds of emails and phone calls about how awful this system was. You would have thought that we had created the dumbest teacher evaluation system in the history of the world. Um, now, interestingly, we had an evaluation system before. And if you're not a state that has overhauled your evaluation systems, um, you have an evaluation system too, in all likelihood. In Tennessee, we had an evaluation system. We evaluated tenured teachers twice every 10 years. And I used to say every five years, and then people corrected me and said, actually, in statute, it's only twice every 10 years. And in most cases, it happened year nine and 10 when people remembered it. And as Hannah noted, similar to New Mexico, every teacher was great. So we were 46th in achievement, but every teacher was great, at least in year nine or 10. Um, so I approached this from the perspective from the outset that the question was not whether our evaluation system last year was perfect. The question was, is it better than what we're already using? Right now, I think in education discussions around evaluation, there's a tendency to create this straw person of the perfect system and then hold up every evaluation system and say, look at all the flaws with this system. But the measure is not whether you have a perfect evaluation system. Those of you who have actually held jobs outside of public education know that there is no such thing as a perfect evaluation system. I was at one point in my life a lawyer, and I also worked in the nonprofit sector, and I got evaluated, and were they perfect? No. Was some of it subjective? Yes. Did I disagree with some of the assessments? Yes. Did we do it anyway? Yes, we did, because that's what we do when we're professionals. We try to give people actual feedback, and it's not going to be perfect. The system we implemented was so much better than what we were doing before. Um, very quickly, what we would do differently, a couple of things that all um, point to. Number one, that 15% measure right there, it didn't work. So the idea, and, and we're still doing it, by the way. We haven't gone back and changed it in legislation. We're giving it another year. But teachers and principals coming together to pick how they're going to create a quantitative measure, it doesn't work. People are gaming the system. And you find an odd number of cases where people have miraculously picked the highest test score result area as the seminal measure that they are going to use for the evaluation system. And so, there is a joint gaming of the system with principals saying, oh, my teachers are upset about being evaluated. I'm going to throw them this bone. And teachers saying, I'm going to pick the thing that gives me the highest score. So that piece has not worked. We also needed to do more on the front side to communicate very clearly with teachers about what was going to happen and not rely on communication going through districts and schools. And I think when we took the reins on communication midway through last year, things started to get better. One of the things that we really needed to communicate was, we are open to changing the system. We are going to gather feedback every year. We are going to change the things that don't work. And we are going to listen to you. And I think simply figuring out how to get that message and not filter it through the districts and the schools, but take it straight to the teachers was important. We also needed to do more in terms of the buy-in of the principals on the front side, because the reality is, what we did involved a lot more work for principals. It really was a lot more work. Now, is this the right work? Yes. I had principals multiple times last year say to me, I'm spending so much time in classrooms this year, I can't do my real job. <laughs> that was actually that was a very common thing that I heard. Now, you know, the response to that is fairly obvious. This is your real job. But what is a legitimate complaint is we didn't take any of the other stuff off of their plate, and we didn't do a good enough job of giving them the tools to figure out how to take some of the things that they had viewed as their real job and distribute it. So th that's something that we would do different. Um, what we would do the same, well, 
one thing is we would plow forward no matter what. The fact that we stayed the course despite the noise was critically, critically important. We last year had the highest test score gains in the history of Tennessee. And I attribute a lot of that to staying the course on evaluation. Less because we had um, people who were somehow scared for their jobs, but more because over the course of the year, we had nearly 300,000 conversations between teachers and administrators about instruction and about what was happening in classrooms and what good instruction looked like. That was critically important. I also think it's really important to stay the course on the quantitative piece. And I think the fact that we used a school-wide measure for a number of teachers was uh, critically important as well. And I'll stop there. Terrific. Did you feel my presence hovering? Yeah, I did. <laughs> right. About two minutes ago. Yeah. I will, we'll circle back. I want to I wanna, um, turn it over to Jill. I just will say I think it will be important to circle back specifically around this communications piece and how important is that? And you said getting directly to teachers. How do you do that and what does that look like? But Jill, talk to us a little bit about you're in your third year of implementation and what that means being in your third year of implementation. So a little bit of your history. And then also one thing that um, Kevin uh, because I was hovering, didn't get to, was the tested and non-tested grades. So we see here um, the, the basic equation, but what happens for all those teachers who are teaching art, music, um, any number of subjects that are not, do not have a standards-based assessment, what are you doing, and, and anything else you'd like to put on the table in your learning experiences? Sure. Great, well, good morning. Um, I'd first like to start because there's a lot of Colorado folks in the audience by asking those who are from Colorado to stand up for a second. All right. Almost everyone that you see standing either was we have a co-sponsor of the actual bill, Senator Spence here. We have folks from the governor's office and actually a member who at the time was a co-sponsor in the House here as well. We also have a number of advocacy groups, foundations, and other support agencies. And the reason why I wanted to have them stand is because when Senate Bill 191 passed in 2010, it passed by one vote. It was extremely contentious, and I think something that no one would like to repeat. But last year, we went through the rulemaking process and an interesting piece of our legislation was that it required the rules that our state board, and we have a member of our state board here as well, um, it required that the rules that the state board passed actually go back to the legislature for the legislature to approve, which is a bit of a risky component to the bill. Those rules passed 99 to 1. In that time frame, the community of people that you saw standing and their allies across the state came together to make this bill happen. And in that year, really created a statewide consensus to move forward with this. So one nice piece is, I think there is a shared expectation that we are doing this um, in Colorado, which is a very nice way to begin our work. The way that the law established our educator evaluation system was really to focus 50% um, qualitative, but also 50% on growth, and growth comprised of multiple measures. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, the law required a state council, which was a representative group of about 15 people, to come up with the basics for implementing the law. And the big piece that they started with was establishing the quality standards for educators and then quality standards for principals. And I mention that because I want to build off of a point that Commissioner Huffman just talked about is that this really elevates the conversation about what outstanding teaching looks like. And I think one of the most exciting pieces of this work is that we're having conversations across the state about what great teaching looks like and what it means to be a great teacher. Those conversations are extremely powerful and we're seeing that just the conversations in themselves are helping to elevate the profession. So starting with the standards, we are focusing very much on how we're going to 
observe those in the classroom, as well as capture them through the growth components. So from an implementation standpoint, we focused our first year on testing out just the qualitative, qualitative side of the principal standards. So we did year one of our pilot, which was last year. We have 27 districts that applied to be pilots. We actually felt like we could only have 13 districts. Uh, 27 we selected. We had over 40 that, that requested to be part, so we couldn't accommodate all the demand. Um, but with those 27, we started with the principal, and I want to mention that because I think that was a really positive lesson learned. When people saw that we were first working with principals and the teachers saw, oh, folks evaluating us are having to do this, they haven't gotten to us yet, but watching and seeing what it meant, having the principals get familiar with it as professionals made a really big difference. Uh, we didn't start with the growth side, we just started with the qualitative with principals. This year, we are now layering in the teacher side and the growth at the same time. On the growth piece, um, the growth is multiple measures, and it is four components. You have a measure of in individually attributed growth, collective growth, and then if you have a standardized measure, you would have your summative state, state summative assessment. And if you are in a subject where it's applicable, you would have the Colorado growth, which, which is different than the value add. But you'd have your Colorado growth score. So um, that still leaves for folks a lot of um, non, in the non-tested subjects, but even in the tested subjects, because there has to be multiple measures. It leaves us with um, identifying what those measures would look like. So to answer the question that you had asked, how are we tackling this? We're, we're in the middle of it, so we're learning. But what we've created is um, content collaboratives, is what we're calling them. They're groups of content and assessment experts that uh, applied to be part of this process. We have about um, uh, over 100 of them in each of our 10 content areas. Also, our community college, which runs our career tech ed programs, has convened um, and co-convenes with us educators representing the sectors within our career tech ed. They are meeting to, first we've contracted with national researchers to do a landscape analysis of assessments that are out there in the content areas. Good quality assessments from around the world. So we're getting assessments from New Zealand, say, or other, other countries um, in music, dance, theater. And we're taking those assessments, vetting them through um, an assessment review tool that we contracted with the National Center for Assessment to create. And through that vetting tool, we are, um, the, the actual content collaboratives, which are Colorado educators, are using that vetting tool to see how those assessments match with the standards and um, are valid, fair, reliable, various characteristics that they're vetting them through. Once they've passed that um, screen, they are then put in an assessment resource bank that our schools and districts can then access and use in the field. We're, some of those are commercially available assessments, but we're also trying to have the vast majority, if we can, be free, open access assessments so that districts can use those, and we have had a group sort of stamp them for a mark of quality to get around some of this challenge of selecting assessments and how to do it in a way that has some credibility. So that assessment bank is in the process of being developed. Our districts are very eager to get it and to access it. We're going to be releasing it in stages this December through January. And then for those, assess those areas where there are gaps, where we didn't find assessments, um, we will be working with those content collaboratives. They will be coming together to help create some assessments that districts could access and use. Um, this is difficult work, and it isn't perfect. And once you get your assessments, you have to get them to a common scale. Then you have to combine them, you have to weight them, you know, all of those kinds of complexities. And your psychometricians get nervous. <laughs> Other folks, I think that all of this actually, if you're a psychometrician, your life really got popular this year. Um, <laughs> but um, it's, I, I, I would like to kind of echo what, what Commissioner Huffman said, and that is that it is all better than what we've had in the past. It's all more thoughtful. It is, um, 
more rigorous, and I think it's getting to uh, much richer, deeper conversations in classrooms and schools across our state. I can't um, summarize really quickly a few very, very uh, common themes I heard. Number one, I think we, we blazed over this a little bit, but, and I will say New Mexico is in the middle of implementing a new teacher evaluation system as, as well. And one of the first things we did, and I think I heard it in both of your comments, is there was a, an advisory group that helped shape and inform implementation and also what goes into this teacher evaluation system. And my assumption, and, and push back if I'm, I'm missing it here, that was unbelievably important. To have a group of educators, um, I know in, in New Mexico it was educators, school leaders, superintendents, business men and women, parents, so that we really had a healthy mix, a robust conversation, lots of healthy disagreement to come forward with recommendations and, and what should this system look like. And I just want to, so I, I, everyone mentioned that, I want to highlight, I think that that might be a good um, lessons learned, have one of those. <laughs> so um, make sure that you've got a, a group that's really giving you advice on the ground and moving and, and potentially maintaining their continual feedback. Many of the folks that are advising us are also participating in our pilot. So we get on the ground immediate feedback on what's working and what's not. Two, I heard um, consistently, this is really tough. That might not be shocking to any one of you, but just in case you were not sure and are thinking about heading down this road in your state, it is, it's tough work. Um, it is not easy. However, I think I heard overwhelmingly it's worth it. And uh, is it fair to say it's uh, certainly um, there is a surety that this is a step in the right direction, although it is not perfect. And then I'm going to say the third thing I heard is we're sure we're not perfect in this, but we're sure it's way better. And I think that that's resoundingly what I'm hearing across the nation as folks step in this direction. It's hard, it's not perfect, but it's absolutely where we need to head and we, we know that um, with, with a deep um, surety in that, in, in that regard. Um, third, let's talk a little bit about communications. Jill, you didn't get to talk about that much. Kevin, you mentioned it. How important is communication in this? How are you getting directly to teachers? You mentioned that, Kevin. What, what role does communication play in being successful in implementation? Great. Um, so communication is critical. One of the things that we found is that there were just lots of rumors and lots of unfounded ideas about what was going to happen and simply actually putting out the facts about what was supposed to happen directly in the hands of teachers made a difference in trying to bypass the usual channels that things go through. So we um, actually had, through the districts, um, an email listserv that hit about 80% of the teachers in the state. So we could send emails directly to them. And we also just made a real effort to have lots and lots and lots of community forums. The, um, the governor did a really important thing as the noise was very loud heading into legislative session last year. And our legislative session starts in January. He came forward and at the start of the session and said, I know there's a lot of noise and um, I wanna be clear on two things. Number one, we're not going to change the evaluation system this year. We are going to see this through. But number two, we are going to study the evaluation system and we will put out a report and we will make changes based on that report. And we actually enlisted an outside group, Tennessee SCORE, which is um, an organization that includes a lot of stakeholders, and they did a bunch of roundtables um, around the state with educators and gathered information. They did a survey of all teachers in the state, compiled the results of that survey. They did a number of things that then led them to feedback recommendations to us. And because we genuinely didn't believe that there were any sacred cows and our goal was to figure out what worked and what didn't and make changes, it was a great system, but it was really important to communicate to teachers that um, we were willing to listen. Jill, can you comment on communication as well? Sure. Um, and, I, and I should just share, we are actually in our sort of third year of the pilot process. It's 20, 
13, 14, this coming fall, that all of our districts will be implementing. So it has not hit full implementation in the way that it has in Tennessee. So we've been working on communication through a couple of avenues. One is the folks that I had stand up, where actually many of them are all part of a statewide um, group that has been has its communication folks all meeting regularly to get shared messaging out to the field. So we're using the same communication tools, same words, same language through the school board network, through the school executives network. The communication folks of those different groups have come together to say, let's get the same um, language out. In addition, we have um, organizations called BOCES, Boards of Cooperative Educational Services, and those agencies um, support our districts in the field, particularly in our rural districts. About 80% of our districts are rural. And so these service agencies um, have been working very closely with us to ensure greater communication. I would also say that one of the things that's helped us is a way that we're trying to frame um, this educator evaluation work because it really is just one piece of a broader set of reforms that we're trying to do in Colorado. And we're really trying to frame those reforms around the notion of the teaching and learning cycle. And teachers are really familiar with and comfortable with the three questions that you ask. You know, what is it that we want students to know and be able to do? How will we know? And then what will we do about what we know? We actually are asking those same three questions at every level of our system. For students, we're asking it, what is it we want all kids to know? Those are our new standards. And we have 10 content standards, two of which are the Common Core. Um, how will we know it's our new assessment system? And what will we do? Well, those are all the things that we do around response to intervention. Um, IEPs, read plans, those kinds of things. So that's for our students. Well, our teachers, we're asking those same questions. What is it we want all educators to know and be able to do? Those are educator quality standards. How will we know? Those are the evaluations. And what will we do about what we find out? Well, that's our professional development plans, remediation plans, and other supports, induction for new teachers. And then we ask those same three questions of the system as a whole. What do we want schools and districts to be able to do? Those are the performance indicators that we have for our schools and districts. How will we know? Those are what we call our school performance frameworks or grades that some of you have in your states, our accountability system. What will we do? We have unified improvement plans for all of our schools and districts. So those same three questions really frame our whole system. And as we explain our reforms and what we're trying to do, around that teaching and learning cycle and building a whole system, a learning system, that's what we're really trying to do and I think that communication is assisting us. Terrific. Um, I'm gonna go back to something Kevin, you said, um, because folks know that we have no sacred cows, there's a comfortability, a, a willingness to say, okay, we're gonna learn, we're gonna tweak, we're gonna change, we're gonna modify. Um, each one of you is in your um, third year of, of implementation, I'll say, um, what are some of the things that as you go through, you mentioned the 15%, you haven't changed it yet, but it's a learned lesson. I will say in New Mexico in our pilot alone, one of the big uh, things that's emerging in our pilot, number one, that teachers, beginning teachers, this will come as no surprise to some of you, are not coming in prepared to teach, period, end of story. However, um, uh, and we might have been able to articulate that based on research studies and, and anecdotal information, one of the things that's happening is the aha moment. We are liter literally visiting every single site that's piloting in New Mexico and seeing these superintendents and principals on the ground doing observations of their teachers. And number one, the what we'll call great inflation that is so prevalent, there's these aha moments of, oh, there's a natural inclination based on my assumptions about this teacher that I've known for forever. And immediately that informs the evaluation above and beyond a, a defined protocol. And so just a, a, a cross check of that and seeing our principals in particular, and Kevin commented on this, um, it seems a no brainer that our principals should be in our classroom seeing what's happening. It, it is not a no brainer, it was not happening in New Mexico and there was a huge disconnect um, amongst uh, kind of our leaders and our teachers and what's taking place. Those are a few things we're seeing in our pilot. What other things are you seeing 
that if you were advising some who are probably getting ready to uh, take this, this step towards a new evaluation system or mid-stride that you've changed, tweaked, or modified? Yeah, so l let me show you some data. Um, so what we have up here is on the top, TVOS, which is our value-added scores, um, and it's not done by quintiles, it's done by standard deviations from the expectation. And on the bottom are the observation scores given by principals. This was last year, 290,000 observations and um, tens of thousands of individual teacher effect scores. So what you will see is that on the value added side first, good news, and I share this everywhere I go, more than half of the teachers are advancing students more than you would expect in a year on the numbers. And this is a three-year rolling average that we use. Value-added scores tend to be attacked because they scare people. They're actually quite resilient. We've used them in Tennessee for a long time. And people who are ones tend not to get a whole lot better. And teachers who are fives tend not to get a whole lot worse. And we have a lot of data to support that. But half of our teachers are actually quite good on the numbers. Here's the bad news. One in six of our teachers is getting a one on their value added scores, which means that they are advancing their students significantly less than you would expect in the course of a year. Two standard deviations less as measured over a three year rolling average. Now you look at the observation scores and effectively what principals did is create a bell curve around three, four, and five. They said, okay, I got it. I'm not gonna give everybody a five this year. By the way, all of our principals had to pass an inter-rater reliability test. So they all took four day courses and passed inter-rater reliability tests. But the human element of this work is so hard, especially in small systems, and especially in a context where a principal not only knows the teacher, but has told them they're outstanding every year for a decade. So to come back and, and say something different is hard. And, and what you'll see is we had a very hard time getting principals to say somebody was doing a poor job. So one of the things we heard all last year was from principals was, I want more differentiation. I want to spend less time with my fives and more time with my ones. And my response, because we were collecting the data in real time was, you don't have any ones. You're not giving anybody a one, so that is not a valid argument. You can't tell me you want to spend more time with your low performers if you're not willing to identify any of them. But what we have done this year through state board rule is we differentiated the number of observations based on performance on either the overall evaluation result or the value added score result. So teachers who are ones are getting more observations this year. That to me makes all the sense in the world. If a teacher is a one on value added scores, don't we want them to get more feedback? Don't we want somebody in their classroom to help them attempt to get better? And it also, I think, sends a message to the principals and to the teachers that we have noticed that the performance is not what we would expect and we expect that it needs to get better. So we, um, we, we had a, significant um, gap between what our value added scores look like and what our observation scores look like at the lower end of the scale and that is something that we are taking on very aggressively this year because I think it's critically important. If we don't, if we tell teachers who are not performing at a high level, if we tell them they're performing at a high level and then we don't give them any help or any feedback on how to do things differently, why would we expect results to change? Results are gonna look exactly the same if we keep doing that. So we have to take this on. I'll comment on a couple things that I heard in that that I think are really important. Um, number one, the, um, the importance of training. And, and you mentioned inter-rater reliability. I know we've talked about in New Mexico certification process for those who are going to be observing to ensure they're trained and ready and equipped to be effective. It's, it is not just walking in and blazing through and saying things look nice in here. Kids are sitting still and moving on. It's, it's, a, it's a very key piece of each, another, uh, another uh, takeaway. It's a key piece of every evaluation system that's represented here today. So those observations matter. And they're also an unbelievable um, 
in, impor their importance is great in providing actionable feedback. Kevin hit on this. We found in New Mexico when we talked to teachers, they said, if and when I get my evaluation, the feedback I get comes around May, if and when I get feedback, at the end of the school year. It does me absolutely no good, and there's a complete breakdown in the hope and aspiration of real change and improving my craft based on real-time information, whether it's data or observed um, teaching practice, to be a better teacher. And so, and I think that's one of the battles we're hitting up against when you talk about how hard is this. It's hard because teachers have, they've got some experiences and they haven't been great when it comes to how do I get better, who's providing me real feedback that actually equips me to, to change. So there's this, a sense that I think you have to, you have to um, address that great, I'm gonna get an evaluation. It's not gonna make me look good and when I get it, I'm doomed. Instead of when I get it, there's going to be a charge, a challenge, and an opportunity for real change that when that change is made, I'm going to see it in my observation uh, scores, etc. Comment a little bit more about how important are these observations, how important is training and, and that piece in regards to those who are actually implementing this on the ground. Um. So first, I'm taking all these great notes from learning from you. So <laughs> as we go to full implementation next year. But um, I wanted to, to make a, a couple points that I think will go with the observation piece. Um, one of the things that we recognize is that schools are not having to just implement an evaluation tool. We're also throwing at them the new standards, which go live in 13, 14, new assessments, which go live in 13, 14, a new accountability system that's in its second year. It's a lot of stuff on their plate. And we've been working with our partner, the Colorado Legacy Foundation, to um, really show districts how you can integrate these reforms and how collectively they actually can help you. And I think one of the lessons learned there that, that connects back to this observation piece is that when you can start with instruction, you can start with providing educators with great instructional tools and support, they want people to come in and watch them in the classroom. We've had the chance to pilot with some support through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and with our Colorado Legacy Foundation, the literacy um, design collaborative tools and math design collaborative tools. Some of you may be familiar with those. Um, our teachers who have been implementing those, which are aligned with the Common Core, are so excited about what they are doing that they're really sort of like, bring it on, come on, come in my classroom, come and watch me because what I'm doing is so different than what I've done before. I want you to come and observe and be a part of this. And that's what we want. We want to, we want to create an excitement around teaching and learning and the profession and the practice of great teaching and have people coming in and having a, a strong dialogue about that and getting excellent feedback real time about how they can improve that instruction. So that's a real lesson learned for us is um, how can we take what we're learning in those integration pilots and really expand it out um, because it takes the fear out of observation, the fear out of evaluation and the pride in teaching um, is, is solidly there. I think for us, um, we are challenged, and I think all states are, with how do you help those principals and peer observers, whoever might be conducting those observations, have a shared notion of what excellent teaching looks like. So those rubrics are incredibly important, and getting iterator reliability on those rubrics is incredibly important. So we're right now looking at ways to do um, not only a great deal of training around those rubrics, um, but also to see if we can do some web-based um, kinds of training that will actually help people observe videos of good practice and calibrate against those rubrics so that they can have some consistency of what outstanding teaching looks like. I'll just comment on that real quickly too. I will tell you one of our um, we're in process in New Mexico of creating video modules of what does it mean to be a five, an exemplary, what does this look like in any given area of, that, of observation? So we have four key areas 
um, that are observed in a classroom. So if I was a two, but I wanted to be a five, I need a visual, and I want to see another colleague from across my state who's living it, and I can look at that, and then linked to that, what is the training and professional development right there? Not only can I see what I can aspire to, so it's not a hopeless cause. I've got a colleague who's there. I can see it. And then what, what are professional development and training tools and opportunities are available for me to close that gap in that given area? So we're in the process of developing those. And I think that's a big piece of saying it's, we're not leaving you with just your evaluation. We're then saying, and here are the tools. And here's what it looks like. Um, so that there's an actual, there's that actionable feedback immediately. So I think that's a key piece. And Kevin, you, you look like you were gonna comment on that as well. Yeah, I just, a couple things to react to. So one is we did do all this training for principals and we do have the video modules, which I think are useful. And I think principals left the training broadly on the same page. Um, I just think the human element of this stuff is really, really challenging. And I don't, I don't wanna undersell that piece of it because I've gotta say the human element of it went a lot easier in the pilot than it did when it was full scale implementation. Um, I, I had a principal uh, um, come up to me earlier this year and he said, um, he said he, he's in South Tennessee and he said, Commissioner, this work is hard. I had to start going to church in Alabama. <laughs> and I just think in the, especially the smaller towns, it's real, you know, it's, you know these people so well and having to sit down and say, you're a good person, but you're not getting the job done and we've got to get you to a better place is really, really hard work and requires constant vigilance. I could not, we have very small districts as well. I was visiting House, a district of 50 students. I met every single student in that district. Well, let me tell you, the teachers in that district, um, they all go to church together. They, all their kids were raised together. And um, this is their community. The, church, the school is what makes that community. So I, I do think that is, you cannot underestimate. Those are your greatest strengths and your greatest weaknesses. And how do you begin to acknowledge that in the midst of something like an a new evaluation system? We have toyed with, and I'll, I'll so to build on that, one of the things we've ta thought a lot about, and I'd love your, your thoughts, do you have additional, and, and Kevin mentioned this as well, these observations, they take time. On average, around four per year, two to four per year. Um, if you haven't been doing them and you're adding them in, that's, that is time an expectation now we can all sit and say, well, you ought to be doing them, so find a way. But it, it is, it's new, and it, it's an addition. Have either of you in, in Colorado or Tennessee considered having um, folks trained that are not principals, yeah. where you might have a 50% of the observations need to be done by the school leader, and another 50%, let's say, by a cadre of folks that are trained and uh, are, you know, available around the state? What are some of your thoughts around that? Um, we, we do have um, that option in a number of places have taken advantage of it. We, um, we have a couple alternative models that were in use that we approved. Um, one that is heavily focused on teachers, teacher leaders and we also in our statewide model allow people to use teacher leaders and they have to go through the training and so on and, and I think it's great. I wish every district was using teacher leaders, especially now as they get the data back in and they can identify the teachers who are really, really strong and, and they do a great job and I think that builds it into the culture. I also think you know what Gates research shows is that having multiple observers is more accurate than having one observer and we're not at the point yet where everybody is being observed by multiple observers, but that in and of itself leads to a more accurate and effective um, evaluation system. Yes, our law as well allows for folks other than the principal to, and they just have to have gone through an approved training program. Yep. All right, I'm gonna, we're gonna tra transition to all of you. Let me just sum up what I think we've heard. Hopefully we've opened enough doors that uh, the questions and, and queries you have um, can't, will, will uh, be addressed, but just a quick summary. Number one, this is hard, but it's good work. 
and worth doing. Number two, um, having an advisory group is key of stakeholders who can provide you feedback along the way and maybe even going forward. We certainly intend to continue that advisory group as we move past the pilot on into implementation. Piloting seems to be important in the mix. Um, having no sacred cows and really being willing and communicating that you're willing to make changes. It's not perfect. We're going to listen. We're going to change. Training is important um, as you go forward for your principles. Um, having actionable feedback and providing that hope that I can change if my, if my evaluation isn't great is a key piece. Um, the shared accountability, we didn't talk a lot about this, but both of you mentioned for teachers in non-tested subjects and grades, having some um, elements of those teachers' evaluation include their colleagues, um, uh, the results of their school, if you will. I think that's uh, something that you both mentioned, but we didn't dive into. I think there's, there, that's uh, worth mentioning, absolutely. Uh, one thing we didn't talk a whole lot about is you'll see that in some ways there's a lot of variability, and in other ways there's not a lot of variability from state to state. In general, 50% of an evaluation is based on quantitative, 50% based on qualitative. Observations are absolutely key in that mix. Um, improved student achievement, showing growth over three years worth of time, important piece. We didn't talk a lot about these things, but I think we would all say those are in those, our evaluations and they're important pieces to be successful. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and say I think those are some of the, the things that came out of listening to the panel. Thank you, um, Kevin and Jill, and now we'll open it up to um, you in the audience to, to take some questions. We've got about 25 minutes, um, and I, I'm not sure if we're, are we miking questions? We are. We've got a mic here in the middle. The, um, um, Hannah, my question, Secretary, my question is to uh, Kevin. Kevin about the Michelle. chart up here, and as I'm, if I'm interpreting the chart correctly, 23% of the teachers were rated a five, but 39% um, got a five in academic gains. The question I have is what percentage of the 23% were in the 39%? In other words, those probably weren't the two same populations. No, though, it was actually where our overlap there was pretty good. So the average value added score for teachers who were observed um, as a five was, I forget what it was, but it was something like 4.4 or 4.5. So they did a pretty good job on the high end. They just, they, they probably had close to the right bell curve. It uh -huh. just was in the wrong place. So the huge mismatch is down at the bottom. You have 16% right. of your teachers who s appear to be failing the system, but they're not given that feedback. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I would say, I mean, if I'm in the 50% of teachers who are doing a great job by the numbers, you know, I'm outraged that I'm treated the same, paid the same, regarded the same as my colleagues who are holding back the system. And we had the best gains that we've ever had despite the fact that one in six of our teachers was two standard deviations below expectations, and which just shows how good the teachers at the top end are. Yeah. Good. Hi, Kayla McGannon from Stanford Children, Colorado. Obviously, we are so appreciative of everything that Jill has done with the help of the Legacy Foundation, but my question is for you, Commissioner Huffman. One of the things that we're starting to hear in Colorado as we prepare for this um, has to deal with the student teaching component. You brought this up, Secretary Scandera. We are starting to hear pushback from districts very concerned about the growth measure component of an evaluation for a teacher um, and how that would affect their score if they allowed for a student teacher to come in for the course of the year. And as teacher preparation is of the utmost importance and wanting them to see what the new standards look like, how the new assessments are used, have you gone through that in Tennessee? What are the lessons learned? And how can the rest of us who want student teachers with great instructors yeah. um, make that transition? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and we haven't figured it out. But we started to have some districts push back and say, we don't want to take student teachers in certain grades and subject areas. And schools of ed came to talk to me. And I mean, first of all, I think you can just ask the question, is the school of education uh, uh, system working as it is right now. I mean, is our objective to preserve the school of education system as it exists right now? Because our analysis by the data would suggest that 
it's maybe not worth preserving as it is right now. But what I said to schools of education is, guys, do some analysis here. Look at the data, because there are two possibilities. Either number one, having a student teacher does not negatively impact student learning, in which case, take that out to the districts and show them. Or number two, it does negatively impact student learning, in which case we really need to have a conversation about that and what that means for the model. Um, I, I haven't had any of them come back to me, though, to have that conversation. <laughs> I'll interject and just say one thing. This, this has absolutely, you think you're on a mission to implement a new evaluation system, which is true. But invariably, there are so many other conversations, and we've, we've uh, hinted around the edges. Number one, I can tell you in New Mexico, we've begun a conversation with some of our deans about what are the, in fact, we have a dean of our School of Education on our advisory implementation team, and he's hearing mm -hmm. all this. And, and it's a great conversation for him to be a part of, and the, the next question is, what are we going to do about it when it comes to teacher prep? And should this somehow <laughs> circle back to our schools of education and our teacher preparation programs, alternative or traditional, and inform the conversation towards policy as well? And I think the fundamental answer is yes. And you'll see various states taking jumps in that. Another piece, and I'll just uh, mention this as well, we haven't talked about, but mentioned barely, and that is, how does pay align with this? Does it? Doesn't it? Uh, you know, there's so many different pieces that you begin to touch when you, when you shift on this evaluation system. Hi, I'm Jennifer Shu with Clairvoyant Technologies. Um, thank you both for coming to take t take the time to um, tell us more about all your continual efforts, and, and thank you very much for all your hard work. Um, my question is actually around um, what technology have you been using at all, if any, for this, and if so. Um, uh, where's the gap? Like, what is something uh, from a technology standpoint that you think could really, really help um, with with this effort? Um, with our pilots, we're using um, a, 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 a kind of a free program right now called Bloomboard, um, and it's for us right now the technology that our districts need are um, a way to capture the observation data and to put it into a system a way to drop in their performance measures, um, way to calculate the growth, combine their measures, um, kind of a way to have a dashboard so that at any point in time they can see how many folks they've evaluated, get reports, those kinds of things. So we're testing out that tool. Um, we'd like to make something similar if that ends up being um, a good tool for our districts. We'd like to make that available to all districts. And I should point out that in Colorado, we have developed a state model system. That's what's being piloted. But our districts don't have to use it. They can choose their own. Um, and so it needs to meet or exceed the state model system. So that adds some complexity overall to what we're offering. Um, but we're trying to include a lot of incentives to go with the state model system, such as having um, a technology platform that supports the system. Yeah, we've got um, um, some data gathering systems that are reasonably good, but um, I don't think we have great technology that is furthering instruction. And I think there is a lot of opportunity there as we get all of this data in on what teachers are doing well and what they're not doing well to hone in really clearly on what would it mean to be really good at this one thing on the rubric that's holding you back. And, and technology should enable that. Right now, it's not really enabling it. Okay. So one thing that we're, we're looking at with our technology system though, um, is as these systems start to talk together more effectively, is that once we, um, once folks start to see what standards they're maybe performing lower on, that that actually would then connect to some resources and sort of a resource bank that would then tap them into all kinds of training, professional development, resources that might assist them with that particular area of need. And a lot of the kinds of programs and space that's evolving here, they're starting to make those smart connections. And I think that has potential. Okay, thank you very much. Jamie Lund, Freedom Foundation, Olympia, Washington. Um, how robust is your student growth measurement system? How many tests per year, subjects, grades, and who pays for that? So in Tennessee, we had one big advantage, which is we've been doing value-added scores for almost two decades. And um, so we actually had a lot of data 
going back in time. And for um, uh, teachers, it'll depend on what they're teaching, but we gather it for and grades three through eight, um, you know, social studies, science, reading, and math. And then we have certain tested subjects in high school. And um, it draw, the way our value added system works is it's based on the individual student and it draws from every single test that that student has ever taken while in Tennessee and uses that along with information on the current test to draw prediction on how much the student would grow. And, um, and, and I think I said this, but we use um, for evaluations three years of data for teachers. So when you get a teacher value added score, you're getting it for three years. Now the disadvantage is it doesn't hone in on exactly what just happened this year. Mm -hmm. The advantage is it's more accurate and it's more resilient and it leads to a number that is uh, a more accurate reflection of, of, we have fewer errors. In Colorado, we have um, been using, obviously, the Colorado growth model. It um, is not a predictive model, it is a normative model. And we, um, and it's in our tested subjects for math and reading, writing, communicating. Um, so those are the areas that would have a growth model component. When we're talking about growth with our evaluation system, we're really looking at student learning over time. And we're in the process of creating that bank of measures and ways of helping people think about and calculate growth over time on a range of different kinds of assessments. I'm going to interject because I heard one other piece of question I don't think we hit on, and that is, Who's paying for this? Um, yeah. And let me ask this, is there a cost for transition? Maybe it's a one, two, or three year, one time cost, two or three, and, and or do you see this as an increasing cost over time to your state budget, or we're doing evaluations now, we're doing them well, but we're doing them, and we're implementing new stuff. Talk a little bit about the budget and what your expectations are. Yeah, so oddly enough, we didn't in Tennessee have to worry about the cost because we'd been doing it, and we had all this information, and teachers got it. it just didn't count for anything, it wasn't used. So the state pays for it um, through a contract. We contract with SAS to do our work. Um, but, um, and, and so it does obviously cost money that the state is absorbing, but our legislature has um, been appropriating funds for that for a couple decades. Mm -hmm. So for the, the subjects where we have the Colorado growth model, the state pays for that and calculates that. Teachers get reports, those sorts of things. Um, for the non-tested subjects and grades, this resource bank that we're establishing is our attempt to provide a range of options for districts um, and to try to find as much that is free but also to help districts recognize that they use assessments all the time. And especially many of them use um, some very you know, well-known and respected interim assessments and um, that they can access and leverage those existing. So we're really trying to help them see how they can use what they already have thoughtfully and well. I'm gonna push on it one more time though. I think there's something important here. Um, so there's one thing to have your money that you set aside for your, basically your accountability system which you had in place or et cetera, where the state's paying for that. What about training, um, professional development? The, are, are you allocating any new monies? Are you seeing a, we've been investing just in the wrong place before and we're, re, we're shifting our investments, but no new, no new monies or new monies? Yeah, no, it costs us um, a couple million dollars a year to train all the people who need to be trained and the state is absorbing that cost. That cost will go down over time because we're not gonna have to cycle people through four day trainings mm -hmm. every single year, um, but it is gonna be an ongoing cost. And we used, we were fortunate to use race the top funds out of the gate on that, but we're gonna have to absorb it into our regular budget because it's an important expense. Mm -hmm. And that's the same in Colorado. We are using some of our race the top funds to help implement and provide the training and support around the program. And we'll be proposing the same thing in New Mexico as well mm -hmm. for that transition. I'm Bill Korak with the report card, and this question is for all of you. Um, I gather you're all, you've all started from a place where evaluations were not realistic in Mexico where everybody was rated excellent, and yet the state was fairly low rank. So now you, you're in various stages of implementing a more realistic evaluation. When will you be at a stage where the proof of concept, in other words, improved student outcomes, 
becomes uh, uh, thorough, and, and, and will that make your job much easier then after that? Well, we got our results back in June, and thank goodness it was the fastest growth that we had ever had on test scores, which I think has helped us to make the case. Is it all evaluation? No, but do I think that's a big piece of it? Yeah, I do. Um, and so I actually think results start coming right away, um, though, you know, we've got to see that on national tests as well. I, but, you know, the reality is there are reasons to do this, even if you don't get immediate growth in student test scores, just in terms of differentiating and recognizing and paying people more who are doing a better job. Um, you, know, you think about the fours and the fives on our scale, and I want to pay them more, and I want to treat them differently, and I want to hold them up. You can't do that if everyone is a five. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, let me ask this as well, and uh, you're punctuating a point. I, I've shared this story a couple of times uh, and in talking about this. I was on the elevator at our, our Capitol, and uh, there's one other woman on the elevator with me, um, and she said, what do you do? Is, I was two days on the job, and I said, I work in education. And I said, what do you do? And she says, I'm an architect. And I said, oh, that's great. And then silence as we're heading up on the elevator. And she says, I used to be an educator. And I said, why aren't you still in education? And she said, I was tired of being excellent. And I was a, early in my career, and there was no advancement possibility for me. And my colleague next door, who had been in the profession 30 years, was paid 20,000 more than I was, and I, there was no differentiation, and in fact, her pay was higher than mine. And I do think that's a huge piece of, are we, are we attracting, number one, our best and brightest? I talked to our dean at our math and, of math and science at our higher ed um, institutions, and they say, invariably, in year two or so of our teacher prep programs, we're losing our math and science folks. And I said, why? He says, it's anecdotal, but they're leaving for a profession where they can make more and accelerate faster. So one of the things we haven't touched a whole lot on is, have you aligned your pay systems yet? Um, if you have, uh, just a comment on that. And have you aligned your advancement uh, systems as well? No. Uh, <laughs> All right. We, we, we actually, we had a, a horribly botched effort that we tried last year, and, and it didn't work. But we're, we will get there. And, and our answer is, is no with a but, and the but is that the, the law actually opens the opportunity for that and really makes that next discussion very permissive. But where we're, we're finding the natural next discussion that will be um, a hot topic this legislative session is around licensure. And um, what is, right now we have an inputs-based licensure system feeding into now an outputs-focused or outcomes-focused educator evaluation system. We're preparing teachers on standards for licensure that are not the same as those educator quality standards that I shared about earlier. So we're in the process of rethinking what it means to define exit from your educator prep program and entrance into the profession and what it means to maintain that license. You know, completing six credit semester credits, 90 clock hours and submitting and turning in your um, license renewal papers does not necessarily make you a better teacher. So we're exploring options for connecting in smart ways your uh, effectiveness ratings with, say, automatic renewal of your license, those kinds of things that may make us have a more effectiveness-based system of licensure. I'll just make one comment along those lines. Often I am horrified with how much time and energy in education is spent around what I call systems. Not that systems aren't important, but when systems dictate what, what we're trying to accomplish instead of our students, we've, we've missed the boat. And I will tell you in New Mexico, and I don't think this is, I worked in Florida, <laughs> I mean, it, systems seem to drive instead of what we say we're really about. One of the most exciting pieces to me about changing the evaluation system is we're beginning to align a system with what we say is important. And fundamentally, it raises all the questions about all the other systems that are not aligned. And so there's a, a heck of a lot of energy right now spent around systems that are not reinforcing the things that we say matter. But I believe this is one huge step towards starting to align a system 
with the things that we uh, think are important, and it's begging the question in so many other areas in regards to pay, advancement, et cetera. So I, I think that's a big piece of what's happening is we're, ask we're calling the question on our, our education system as it is in a, in a fundamentally important area. Hi, uh, Eric Laram from Students First. Uh, first of all, thank you for blazing the trail. It's incredibly important as we work with states across the country to be able to point to what you all are doing as a demonstration of, of what's possible and what can work. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about this balance between setting a high bar at the state level and allowing enough flexibility at the local level to define their own systems, get what works for them, and also get the buy-in of their local teachers. And specifically, uh, and just pretend there are no legislators in the room, uh, the enacting legislation you have uh, in place whether, you know, how much cover has that given you versus is it really just a directive? Uh, would you prefer that it was more prescriptive, less prescriptive, or is it about the right balance? For us, I think the legislation is actually a good balance because it sets out the parameters in terms of the, um, um, the scoring, the 50, 35, 15 piece, but leaves a fair amount of flexibility um, on what you're going to do. And, and so I actually think it's a pretty good, it, set up on the legislation. We'll probably make some tweaks to it or we'll, we'll ask for some tweaks, but it's generally pretty good. Um, the, the question on district flexibility is a good one. And one of the things that we did um, uh, in an effort to sort of learn from last year is we gave districts the option to submit flexibility plans for this year. Um, this year, by the way, I haven't talked at all about this year. This year, it is so quiet. I, it makes me nervous, it's so quiet. Um, but people are just sort of rolling along with things. But so we gave our 136 districts the option of, um, we had piloted three alternative models so they could switch over to one of those models. They're pretty good models too. Or they could apply for flexibility. And as long as it was within the, the law and within state board policy, you could make tweaks. So you could say things like, you know, instead of doing, you know, four full-length observations, what we want to do is two full-length observations and six walkthroughs and, you know, that sort of thing. Interestingly, um, as much complaining as there had been about the evaluation system when we put it out, you know, come forward with your own proposal. Um, something like 15 of our 136 districts came forward with a proposal. And actually, I was so mad and frustrated that I went back and said, you know, hey, last call on this. You know, we're gonna give you another two weeks, but last call, and honestly, if you don't come forward with your own proposal, don't complain about the state model anymore. And we had about 40 that came forward with some modest tweaks to the system, but just giving that flexibility and making sure people knew that they had it, I, I think is actually important heading into this year. Um, I would I would agree in terms of our legislation. I think that it set the right parameters and gave us the right amount of flexibility. There was a lot of debate though with our state council on um, the opt-in, opt-out sort of uh, phrase of do you, are you required to opt into the system? Do you, can you just opt out? What do you have to prove? Uh, what level of documentation do you have to submit to the state? We debated a lot about do we create kind of yet another little mini bureaucracy to review plans of districts that they submit and compare them to the state model? Is that a good use of time? How do we set this system up to provide that right level of flexibility? And so where we've landed is on setting up a, a strong model system that has lots of incentives for districts to go forward, but then to create a pretty tight um, reporting and that all districts, no matter what standards they use or what effectiveness ratings they give have to report back to us in a way that's aligned with our standards and aligned with our effectiveness ratings. So they may have five criteria, they still have to report back to us on the four. And then we will be able to produce the charts that you see here by district and at the school level and through that transparency of showing the connections between the ratings and school performance and student performance results. We feel like that's our hook um, for accountability and holding them accountable for whatever model they're implementing. So I, am, uh, I have the unpleasant um, job of, it's been wonderful to, to facilitate this, to now say we have a long line and time is out. 
I want to ask um, Kevin and Jill if you would any closing comments as you know sometimes you sit and say I should have mentioned anything you want to share and thank you for those who stood patiently we didn't get I'm sure Jill and Kevin are happy to stay here for the next hour or two no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but any closing comments yeah, I just, I think you can't underestimate the difference between pilot and implementation in terms of the noise, and I think especially for policymakers and, and legislators in the room, um, when you implement, there's just a massive amount of noise that leads you to question, maybe the system isn't good. I mean, why are people so unhappy? But you just have to remember how rigged the system has been in this country for so long, and the volume of noise that we heard, interestingly, didn't come from teachers who were getting ones or twos. It came from teachers who were getting threes and fours, but for their entire professional lives, they had never been given critical, constructive feedback, starting from when they were students in schools of education. And that rigging of the system leads to a world in which implementation is incredibly challenging and it is so important to stay the course and actually see what comes of it and not give in to the pressure and the noise. Jill. Um, I think I would just share a story from one of our integration districts um, about one of our teachers who um, had the opportunity to be observed while she was using some of the new tools. And um, it just happened to be a day where one of her students was able to stand up in front of the class and really demonstrate their learning. Um, and it was a breakthrough moment for that teacher and for that student. And at the end, um, the kids came up and said, this is the, the best day I've had in school. And the teacher said, yeah, we're having a good day. And it was when she's being observed. And I think that that's the power of this is to amplify and accelerate the number of good days that are happening for kids and for teachers. It's for both across the state and across the country as these reforms are being implemented. Good. Well, a huge thank you to both Kevin and Jill. So.